I wanted to start to get to know you a little bit more because sure. I, don't, I don't know you that well. Sure. You're, you are. You came into the church how many years ago? Uh, 2017, Easter of 2017. Awesome. Yeah. With your wife at the same time? Uh, just about. She was. We were not married at the time. We were about to be engaged. Um, we were both students at Hope College here in West Michigan, mm-hmm. which is a Dutch Reformed school, interestingly enough. Um, and uh, long story short, through a lot of different influences, one of those influences actually coming to a coming to Mass here at Sacred Heart, at our parish of Sacred Heart, experiencing the divine beauty of the Mass and hearing sacred music in its, its proper context, uh, we started our road into Rome after a long discernment. I came from a, a Presbyterian background and then entered into kind of through Anglicanism as, as I was studying sacred music. It's a pretty natural route. And then my wife was coming from a more Baptist kind of background. So... Um, yeah, we. I came in in Easter of 2017, and then she came in in Corpus Christi of that year because she was um, out of the country during Easter of that year. But we came in in the same RCAA class and everything like wow, that. And okay. then soon, it's like I think soon. The, I think either the day before or the day after she came into the church, we were engaged, and then the next year we got married. And oh, that's fantastic! So it's yeah, it's been what a, a love journey. story. Yeah, very uh, very much so. Yeah, the, the Fold Sheets book is three to get married. It's like a try exactly love story. loving Rome and uh, coming together. It's exactly it. yeah. Uh, and what? So you said you were you were studying sacred music. Is mm-hmm. your BA from Hope like sacred yeah? It's music? a ba- bachelor's of music and okay. or- organ performance would be the okay. formal degree. Um, but yes, st- sacred music as a whole. So organ was my like concentration and st- studied that thoroughly. Became a you know professional organist. Um, but then a lot of choral conducting on the side, a lot of singing, a lot of study of music history. Um, so yeah, sacred music as a whole is my field. Okay. Um, the organ is my more formal concentration. Was yeah. your was your first exposure to Sacred Heart just academic then? Uh, coming to coming to mass at Sacred Heart yeah. then? Yeah. So uh, not really. It was, I guess it's a good question. Um, I had been reading on my road into Roman Catholicism. Again, I was an Anglican when I was in college, freshman sophomore year of college. I was an Anglican. Anglican that kind of flirted with Rome, which is dangerous, uh, flirted with orthodoxy a little bit, you know, this world, um, and trying to figure things out. Um, uh, intellectually, I think I was understanding Roman Catholicism. I was interested in it, but I didn't understand its beating heart. I didn't understand its, it just didn't make sense to me. Really what I was experiencing was a disconnect with, um, a disconnect between what was like the the severity of Catholic doctrine? Severity in a good sense. I just mean the severity in terms of from a Protestant perspective. All the Mar- of truth. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah, exactly. All the Marian doctrine. You know the the you know severe the sexual morality. You know the theology of the body and um, all of that, which was appealing to me. But then um, it made sense to me. Purgatory and. Yeah, it's less less Even, strict than the Anglicans, a little soft on ex- one of those issues. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, like, a real severity in terms of their doctrine and in terms of the things that they believe. And obviously, like, that paired with this idea that, you know, through my study of history, that Roman Catholicism was the, um, you know, the womb in which all of, you know, art was created, not just visual art, but music. And, every, I mean, every all of Western civilization was born out of the Catholic Church. And then this was in sharp contrast to when I would go to my local Catholic parish for Mass every once in a while as an Anglican and being like, how in the world did this church produce all of this? Or why, how does this church believe all of these really intense things? But then you got this kind of happy, clappy Mass. For me, it was like total dissonance. Was your Anglican Mass like more reverent? It was pretty high. Yeah, I was okay. pretty high church Anglican. Oh, okay. um, and, I was, and I was kind of reaching the extremes of that. Uh, on my way into Roman Catholicism, so my so my my sense of churchmanship, my sense of liturgy was was pretty high, I would say. Um, also, because I was studying sacred music, so I was just you know wrapped up in that beauty. Um, but that as a as a contrast to what I was experiencing in like your suburban right Roman Catholic liturgies, it just didn't make sense to me. It was yeah. wildly confusing, and actually, it was like pushed me towards cynicism because I was like, I think Rome is correct, but where is the liturgical expression? And so. Speak uh, as a testament to where I was liturgically. I actually, since probably, man, the end of high school, maybe the beginning of college, I um, had been reading pretty regularly the the website, the New Liturgical Movement, mm-hmm. um, which is a wonderful, and I love all those guys. Wonderful, wonderful blog. Um, I've been reading them because I was fascinating. Again, I was fascinated by this idea of Catholics, Roman Catholics, who believed thoroughly in these dogmas that they pronounced, and then they expressed it liturgically. So they would have these beautiful pictures of you know, reverent masses upon these reverent, beautiful altars. And it just, to me, it made sense. It was mm-hmm. like a hand in a glove. Um, 
so that's where I would, uh, that's, that, that was like, I was drawn to that website, even as a Protestant, I was like really drawn to that website. And so randomly in 2017, uh, 2016, it was the first Sunday of Lent, 2016, I was reading that website and I saw posted in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is just down the road from my college, uh, that there was going to be this, um, solemn high mass featuring ironically featuring the choirs of calvin college which is our rival dutch reform school here oh, in west michigan is that hilarious that's, god's that's providence funny. is funny yeah so they were so my my predecessor actually in my job my the former music director was bringing in calvin's choirs to come sing solemn high mass and so i went to my girlfriend at the time my wife madison now and i said hey do you want to go to this thing and she's like yeah sure why not and it happened to fall on the same weekend that we were planning a trip to chicago we had a little bit of a winter break. And so uh, we on Sunday, we came to Sacred Heart. We stumbled in. It was like freezing. It was February here in West Michigan. Uh, we came into the church. It was first Sunday of Lent, right? So like half the congregation is lined up on the side waiting for confession. But we didn't know that. So I was in my head. I was like, is this some sort of penance that they just don't sit during Lent? <laughs> <laughs> you know, some sort of... I was going to my... I couldn't understand. But we sat there. Felt, you know, kind of odd. And then, yeah, again, I was studying sacred music. So I was interested in what was going to happen with the choir. No, nothing, no organ at the beginning. Uh, it's Lent, um, very quiet to begin. And then bell rings, introit starts to be chanted by the skull. And I said, oh, Gregorian chant, this is glorious. Lovely to hear this in its right context. And then Calvin's choir began, the Kyrie, and it was this, I forgot which mass setting, but it was by Victoria, the great uh, Italian-Spanish Renaissance composer. And they began the Kyrie, and for me, it was like, you know, Saul on the road to Damascus. It was like game over. Like, beca- it, I, And not even just like in a not just in an aesthetic sense, but like a whole, a whole being, like the whole soul and body was enraptured. Like it was just like, this is, I, I just felt the voice of God saying, you know, like you've come home. Like this is where you need to be. Because again, it was, uh, I, and then, and then, in, and then in growing into Sacred Heart as a community, as a parish, I began to discover tons and tons of Catholics who not only like believed they only, they, they don't, they, they both walk the walk and talk the talk, but it was tied in and fed by this, you know, rich, rich liturgical life, which is necessary, you know? Um, so I was overwhelmed and both of us had a very similar experience to that, you know? So that's kind of, so it was academic in that my, going back to your original question, it was academic in that I was interested in going to this mass to hear this music in its proper context. And there probably was something spiritual there. There was actually a sense of longing, not long before that time. I think like a month, I remember writing in my journal, like a month before, that account, you know, I was in a pretty dark place. I was jaded with my Anglican church because they were banning me for communion. They were pretty hardcore Anglicans. They were, they weren't letting me go to communion, even though they were shooting blanks. Um, but I, I couldn't go to communion because I hadn't been confirmed growing up as a Presbyterian. I hadn't been confirmed oh, okay. in an apostolic tradition, right? Cause we don't have confirmation in the Presbyterian church. So it was very odd, but my Anglican church back home in the East coast where I'm from in, in the DC area, they were letting me go to communion. And so it was just, to me, it was like, there was just no sense of anything here. There's no sense of authority. There's no sense of procedure. The left hand does not know what the right hand is doing in a bad sense. Um, it, it was kind of chaotic. So I was in a really jaded place. I was, uh, I, to pick, make some money, I was uh, working at a Dutch Reformed church doing some music. And that felt, for me, felt like 400 steps back to go back into a Reformed context with the whitewashed walls. and. Uh. I'm looking for God's face and can't find it. And just, it was just, it was traumatic. It was like, so I was just really, that was kind of a very like low sort of rock bottom place. And then out of nowhere, I kind of discovered the tradition and, 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 and then again, it was game over. It was, wow. I think because my heart was ready. It was, I was like almost at the verge of despair. I'd given orthodoxy a shot, but to me it was always a sense of, um, uh, it always seemed because I was a student of Western sacred music it just to me it just seemed dishonest for me. Byzantine chant yeah. is, is is a little weird. Yeah, I love it. I, I love yeah, it too. Yeah, but I it's love like it. compared to Gregorian chant, if you're, if you're steep in that, yeah. it can be difficult, and it's it just feels foreign compared to the Gregorian chant. And even um, and even culturally, it was this idea of like, yeah. I'm a Western Christian. I knew I knew that I was a Western Christian, so I couldn't go I couldn't go east, you oh, know, in oh. any capacity. So, um that was kind of my journey into Rome and my, me and my wife's journey. And, and then, yeah, to fast forward soon after I started going to sacred heart, I got involved with the music program there. And then when my predecessor left, uh, for another job, um, our, our pastor at the time offered me the position and I was coming out of school and was engaged and my wife's family is from this area. So I said, absolutely. Let's, um, 
let's stay here. <laughs> I mean, I would twist my arm, you know, to be able to be in that context was pretty amazing. So, yeah. That's, that's fantastic. I, I was trying to find this quote. I'll, I'll look it up in a minute. Um, but I, I had a similar Saul road to Damascus when I encountered yeah. uh, Gregoria leg race Missouri Rare. Oh, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sung at the cathedral, mm-hmm. for, which they do every year for Tenebrae. Yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned in your uh, recent essay on Verbum Cordis. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, if you don't know Verbum Cordis, it's the, um, I think I'm getting the Latin name right. I don't remember exactly. But it's, the, it's like the newsletter of the school. Yeah. So you can get on the newsletter no, for right. the school. Um, and you read, you wrote in your essay that uh, something like Gregorian chant is the icon. It's like a sonic icon. Yes. And I wanted to read this, uh, my favorite quote from Vatican II, which is about sacred music. Uh, if I can find it. Let's see. Where is the most sacred mystery? The, where is the section? I thought it was in the back. Yeah. Uh, Where's the sacred music section in Vatican II? Is it, Pop quiz, Jonathan. It would be music, was it music Mind of Sacrum? Was that, was that grafted into the documents? Or would it be at the end of um, liturgical year? Sacrosanctum Cotulium. Here it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so this is paragraph 112 of Sacrosanctum Cotulium. No, crushing it. Good. The musical tradition of the Universal Church is a treasury of inestimable value, greater even than that of any other art. The main reason for its preeminence is that a sacred song united to the words, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. So we have an ecumenical council. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have an ecumenical council placing a judgment on the art of Western civilization mm-hmm. and saying, this is the best art. Yes. All the other art is, is good, but this is a treasury of inestimable value. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about music as a sonic icon? Sure. And comment on this quote from Vatican II, and then we'll get into Palestrina. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So the I think the best... And then a lot of my colleagues agree in the sacred music world, you know, the, the, the best papal document ever written on sacred music is Pius X's uh, Trialis of Lichitudini, yes, which is the great influence for Musica Sacrum, which was a, a, written in the 50s, which then kind of became that section in Vatican II at the end of Sacrosanctum Concilium. Um, and, and Pius X makes that argument right there. I think there's probably a pretty direct quote that, that it's the highest form of music in Pius X goes on because it, it alone has immense power to change the disposition of the heart um, of the faithful um, in receiving the sac in receiving sacramental grace and it alone not that art other art doesn't obviously like we want to r- worship in beautiful churches we don't want to worship in whitewashed churches we don't want to worship in hippie churches with you know spaceship with asymmetry and felt banners and iconoclasm it doesn't help the soul right we need we need aids in this life. Uh, to, to draw us into the physical presence of God and his beauty and the beauty of heaven. Um, but music, because it operates in the temporal sphere, um, and it means that it's, it's active. It's, it's, it, it's, it's ephemeral because it's here and then it goes away, but it, 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 it operates within time as, as opposed to it being fixed like a piece of art. It's like fixed outside of time or it's a permanent piece. No, music is something that's like, it's animated. It's anima, right? It's, okay. it's like a matter of the soul. It, it, it's an animate thing, uh, it, and in that, and because it's an animate thing, it's a mystical thing, and so it's an icon of the Holy Spirit. Because, well, for a lot of reasons, um, sacred music, you know, in its modal language, you know, so uh, to just use pedestrian language, you know, the the modes of the church, a lot, you know, modern music, let's say mu- music written between. 1700, 1650, and you know, 1900, and then and then you know, modern popular forms of music too, operates on what we call a diatonic or chromatic form. So think you know, do re mi fa sol la ti do, right? Yeah. That kind of scale, um, which usually evokes in the heart, you know, severe emotions um, of let's say like happiness or sorrow, mm-hmm. and they're very severe and they're very concrete emotions that are that are evoked in the heart. But the modal language of the church. Uh, in, invokes scales upon which the music is built upon. So instead of do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, for example, in mode one, you have re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, re, always cadencing on re, for example, as opposed to always cadencing on do in, um, in, in, in diatonic music. Um, because of you have this, these, these shifting modalities, the heart experiences and the mind and the soul experiences emotions that transcend concrete human emotions. So like you listen to Gregorian chant and no one says, Oh, that sounds happy, or that sounds sad. Oh, it's 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 okay. 
it's all those things at once, right? It's mysterious. Yeah, as, as opposed to like Beethoven. You've got I suppose like the Beethoven where it's Beethoven severe. Nice, yeah. Nice symphony, yeah. Oh, to joy. That's happy. Yeah, yeah, as right. A, and then right. like this other section, that's angry. Yes, exactly. This, yes. Yeah. Which th- those that have its place. That's not, that's not, that's not to say that this music is not worth our edification. It is, yeah. you know, but in terms of sacred music is music that's set apart. And that's why it employs the modal language because it, it, it gives us universal emotion. It gives us mu- emotion that, brings us outside of time again you listen to Gregor- the perfect example that i use often when i teach about the liturgy is for example we just had easter sunday right two weeks ago easter sunday you know when when when, mo- when many catholics think easter sunday we think you know christ the lord is risen today which is fine has its place triumphant a lot of that does a big hymn yeah, I, like hymn. That one. yeah I don't know no no i'm not that's again i'm not i'm not shaming that uh, vernacular hymnody against is rooted in a um, diatonic chromatic system. It, it makes us feel concrete emotions because that's the neg- that's the that's the nature of devotional music. Hymns are devotional music. Uh, the nature okay. of devotional music devotional is that it's music. it employs concrete emotion because we need that as humans. But in terms of the music separated for liturgical action, that of the mass, that of the divine office, it's modal music. Um, so anyway, going back to Easter Sunday, what's the introit? So in terms of the mind of the church, what's the first thing they want you to hear on Sunday morning? It's the it's the resurrection introit, which is in a very very bizarre mode. The cadence is on the half step, which is a very kind of Eastern sounding haunting, oh, okay. and it's you know uh, the introit. And and whenever I've had multiple people come up to me and say, "Why the heck do you sing that first thing on Easter Sunday?" and I, and I ask them, I said, well, "Well, if you were in the upper room with the disciples, and the God Man who you thought was dead walks through, you know appears through the wall and says, "Peace be with you," and you all fall flat on your face, it's it would scare the crap out of you. Right? Uh-huh. I mean, it's, ter- I mean it's, it's terrifying. You know, the resurrection is, is terrifying and it's, it's, it, there's a spookiness to it too. And the interesting thing about the whole Easter octave is that, you know, every we I, once we did that sacred heart where we sang every day of the octave, um, the propers, the, the propers that the, the skull is sings, the chant is so difficult and so chaotic and it goes a hundred different ways, very unexpected. And then finally you get to low Sunday, like we had last Sunday and it's, it kind of calms back down again. But the whole idea is that, you know, when Easter happens, like the world explodes and <laughs> you're like, it's just kind of chaos, a happy, joyous chaos kind of reigns for a whole mm. week throughout Easter. And so, again, um, I was telling my students about this the other day, like we have to, we have to, the Gregorian chant brings us into um, the mind of the church in terms of it shapes our sensibility in terms of how we should think about these seasons. So Easter is not just a sort of uh, one-sided Happy and joy, triumphant, Lent's done, Christ is risen, woohoo. We can experience that like overwhelming joy. It's a good thing, but it's also like it's chaos. And what does this mean for the world? And, wow. and how is this going to settle? And that's kind of the language of that. That's just one example of where chant brings you into a season in ways that you wouldn't expect. And because, again, it's divine music too, right? So it's sort of like, you know, how Benedict, St. Benedict says, you know, um, is that the path to humility is. Uh, seeing how God views you, like that's that's like true, re- like you know, Kenothi Salton, like knowing thyself. You have to you have to imagine how God views you, and that's like the road to true humility. It's kind of that with Gregorian chant, like it, it, when we hear the modality of the church and the emotions we experience, it's sort of like a little glimmer into how heaven actually regards all of these things, and it's absolutely objective outside of time way of doing that. You know, wow, that's anyway. this is fascinating because yeah. this reminds me of the. <clears throat> Um, the the solemn alleluia for Easter Vigil, yeah, with, that I heard uh, at at my Reverend Nova Soto Parish previously. Yeah, at least the way they did it, it was like a chromatic. You, you go up the steps, yeah, three steps. Yeah, I don't know yeah. If that's traditional or not, but it is. It kind of evokes what you're saying because it, it's like it is quite joyful, obviously, because the alleluia. But at the same time, it's like this chromatic. It's thing haunting. That's yeah. kind of haunting and yeah. bizarre and mysterious, and it's like definitely a a different emotional content it's like an intellectual transcendent emotional content well but this all of this brings up palestrina which is so interesting to yeah me, what you just said because uh in general uh, yeah. as 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 a I'll, I'll i'll give you a layman i'll give the audience a, a sort of a layman dichotomy of, of music because yeah. as i understand it there's sort of there's chant and then there's early renaissance polyphony in 1300s 1400s yeah uh, which is kind of like a few voices and then we've got this polyphony that happens where, and, and if people are not under, understanding what polyphony is, it's taking the chant, which is all people singing the same notes at the same time. Yeah, mine, Polyphony yeah. is everyone singing different notes at different times mm-hmm. in this beautiful tapestry of music. 
Yes. And then after that, we have Baroque music mm -hmm. and uh, like classical. That, that. So, so when yeah. we've got Bach and we've got Beethoven, that's sort of very emotional, as I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to polyphony. Polyphony is very sacred. It's it's very much in the sacred mode. Yes. But it's this transitional sort of music in the sense, cr cr um, chronologically at least. No, that's great. You, you, you did really well. Um, yes, the church is sort of um, the music of the yeah the Renaissance polyphony, which I would say it captures actually all that you just described. So going from about, it even blends into like medieval polyphony in terms of having a modal language, which you know. Polyphony is, uh, uh, as you said, Tim, is it's um, polyphony, meaning multiple voices, and so it's multiple lines of independent, independent vocal lines. So an independent vocal line meaning like it has its own flow, it has its own peak, it has its own uh, climax, has its own cadence. It, it 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 has it's an independent body of music. If you sang that in line of music by yourself, it would sound like it's a complete piece of art. It's a complete concept. It's those lines stacked on top of each other to create harmony that's realized horizontally and not vertically um like a hymn a hymn has harmony harmony has um harmonized yeah. like vertically like here's a chord here's a chord here's a chord no uh polyphony is multiple lines of independent music that are then uh layered on top of each other to create passing har horizontal harmony and you, you just is, if you're not familiar with these terms audience i would just recommend youtubing like just search search polyphony or search palestrina, yeah, like palestrina and then or, like search gregorian chant listen to that and then yeah. search palestrina and listen to that and you'll see the difference with these different the two uh, two different things so they they work th so that's kind of the you know in, in that document we talked about before trilus latitudine um by pius the 10th he 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 this is what he isolates he says the the bedrock of all sacred music um the thing that should have pride of place which is the language of vatican II, is gregorian chant that is like for the reasons we already mentioned because of its modal language also we didn't mention this but it's non-metric language meaning it's not dictated by a yeah like by a, a tempo, beat uh, like by a what beat, we call yeah. the talk to it's not dictated by a beat it go it's rhythmic in that it it moves according to little uh it, according to um there's there there's times when you pause and times when you move and and things like that it has rhythms but it doesn't have a meter it's not bound by a backing beat that's another picture of why it's an image of the Holy Spirit, right? It goes where it pleases. It's like water. It's like smoke. It's mm. like fire. It's all these, all these. It's like a dove, you know, a songbird, which were the only birds allowed in the Levitical law for sacrifice, right? Raptors right. or anything like that was that was not kosher, but it's the songbird, and you know the the you know the oh, okay. sparrow finds a home and the turtle dove a nest for its young and thy altars, O Lord. I mean, it's all the songbird. It's an image, obviously, the bird over the waters and Noah, the Holy Spirit, obviously descending as a bird. St. Francis and the bird. I mean, it's, 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 the bird's a mystical object, but because it, it operates like, wow. like, flies like a bird. Flies like a bird. And, wow. and, and Gregorian chant flies like smoke. I mean, I pray rise like incense before thy sight, right? I mean, it's, it's like the smoke. It's like water, you know, it's like but fire. Poly Polyphony's got meter because they it all has have meter, to be right? So, put together. this is fascinating. So, in, I, this is, this would be a great, if I have time, if I had ever had time, a, a, a great thesis. And someone can, some musicologists can steal this. Uh, <laughs> Um, if you want, uh, would be how Gregorian chant and Renaissance polyphony form a homostatic union in terms of a hom the Gregorian chant is an icon of the divine and polyphony is an icon of the glorified man. So it's governed oh, by a beat, wow. right? It's governed by a beat. We call this the Tactus in Latin. Beat is kind of more like downward. The Tactus feels a little more buoyant, right? So, um, and, and, you know, uh, the notion of like a metronome beat, like BPM, did not exist until probably the late Romantic period. So way in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, that I'm shooting off the cuff there. But, um, but in terms of like uh, the beat that governs Gregorian, or that governs sacred polyphony, like Palestrina, like Josquin, like Bird, like Victoria, any of these composers you can look up and listen to this music, um, it, 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 the beat, it, it's not prescribed to a certain BPM, but the beat is the beat that works within a very ambient space, like an ecclesial space, like ours at Sacred Heart, or like your great European cathedrals, your great European churches, you know, a, a, a true, a nice acoustic, no carpet, carpets from the devil, any of those kind of things. Um, and that beat happens to relate right around, I would say, the beating of the human heart, right around anywhere between 50 and 70 BPM, right? So there's a human aspect to it. Now, it's not a driving beat that's kind of concupiscent, right? I love driving beats. I love folk music. I love jazz. But it's music uh, yeah. outside the church. It's music if I'm going to go into war, I want a driving beat. Yeah, if you want to go into war, but into the church, you don't. So so Renaissance polyphony, yes, it's governed by a toctus, by a beat. 
but it, it's the beat that most closely we all have a beat within us as humans, right? We have a beating heart. We can't avoid a beat. And, and, and Gregorian chant just kind of falls into that. And so I never really have to set this as a conductor when I conduct this stuff or what, and actually a lot of this music, I don't even have to conduct. You just kind of, you just kind of feel it because it has this boom, boom, boom. So it's, it's, it's why I say that poly polyphony represents humanity, the human aspect of that, of the homostatic union of the two, of the two natures of God is because it's, it's humanity in our most natural state. It's the human heart. It's the sacred heart, right? Beating for us. But it's also, uh, it's just enough beat to keep us going as opposed to a beat that to drive us into any sort of wow. concupiscent emotion, right? It's a, it's the buoyant beat that like gives us the life that we need. So that's, a, that's amazing. Isn't I, that cool? I, I yeah. need to, I, we need to promote Palestrina 500. Yeah, sorry. For, sorry we're I, fun. Yeah. I, I just want to talk about all these things endlessly, but Palestrina 500, uh, what is it exactly? And then we'll sure. talk about why Palestrina gets the 500 and no, none of these other no, guys, guys get. Sure, sure. So in the year 2025, our parish, Sacred Heart of Jesus in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, we are celebrating the 500th birthday of Giovanni Pierluigi de Palestrina, who was a Renaissance composer born on February 3rd, 1525. Um, and he was the composer, you know, uh, the exemplary composer at the Council of Trent during the Counter-Reformation. And his music, because of... Not only his skill uh, as a composer, as a, as a his erudite skill as a musician, as an organist, as a as a composer, as a choir master, as a singer, he was everything. He was the whole package. Um, not only his his influence in Rome at that time as being a musician, but because he was at the Council of Trent and and had a great influence in terms of um, the kind of music that was used as an example following the Council of Trent. So that he, his music became the example par excellence of Trinity, of the Tridentine right of, of the, of, of the Roman right post Trent. Um, and, and because he was in that power, that position of power as, as kind of the musical authority at the council of Trent, he was kind of viewed as the, as the, as the standard throughout all of Europe, uh, in the centuries that followed. Um, it really, it, it's, it's only within, within I would probably maybe the last hundred years of scholarship that we, that the West has begun to see other figures as, as, as equal to Palestrina in terms of his influence. But for the 400 years following the Council of Trent, um, he was kind of heralded. And even, I think, it's, I think in Trialis Lotitudini by Pius X, he references Palestrina by name. Now he was, uh, Pope Pius X was an Italian, so they love the guy. You know, they're kind of, they're never going to mention Bird, <laughs> you know, in those kind of uh, documents or anyone like that. But, <laughs> but, but Palestrina gets, he takes the cake in that sense. He also was a prolific, 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 prolific composer. Um, wrote like over a hundred settings of the mass. And we're talking about wow. polyphonic settings of music. So you're talking, you know, 25, 30 pages as, as we commonly have of music, you know, for four voices, five voices, six voices. I mean, huge output. He wrote like 500 motets, which is, uh, you know, tons of offices, uh, hymns for the divine office, tons of magnificats. Tons of psalms for the divine office. I mean, the guy's output was insane. I think it probably could probably say the most prolific. Maybe La Lasus is also pretty prolific, but Palestrina's output is absolutely massive as a composer. That's why his influence spread too. Um, so he really is like we would say the pillar of Re Renaissance polyphony for the Roman rites. He's he's our he's our our grandfather, our our founder of, of, of Western music. One of one of the founders of Western music for the Re Roman Rite, our pride and our joy. And so we're taking an entire year in in, in twenty twenty five to celebrate the man and his and his and his um and his legacy, but not only to celebrate his man and his legacy, but but use this this date of musicological significance to be a form upon which we can evangelize through beauty. Um to bring people in, not only to celebrate his singing his music, because people sing his music all the time. You can go to collegiate choral programs, you can go to churches and hear his music in concert, but to hear his music in its proper context, which is the, within the context of the traditional Roman rite, I mean, that's, and that's the kind of stuff that changes souls. I mean, it changed mine. Yeah, and I mine heard, too. Yeah, right. yeah so, I heard Victoria, you heard Allegri. Um, so so but, what is the, what are the events? Yeah, the so every month Austria? of 2025, um, well, I'll start at the beginning. So in December of this year, December 8th, Immaculate Conception um, of 2024, our bishop's going to come, Bishop David Walkowiak, he's going to come to Sacred Heart and he's going to kind of give us his blessing that day. Um, 
for the whole for the whole give a blessing upon the whole festival and give some opening remarks and celebrate mass for us at our 930 mass um and then um uh from so december 8th of 2024 to december 8th of 2025 once a month for each of those months we're going to be bringing in a visiting choir and that visiting choir is going to sing a choral meditation as a, uh, for an hour long, um, in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, either we're still figuring out whether that's going to be in the tabernacle or exposed. We have to figure, we're going to have a lot of people visiting the church that are not Catholic, so we have to kind of pastorally discern that still. But anyway, it's going to be an act of worship still um, for an hour, a choral meditation for an hour where the visiting choir is going to sing some selections by Palestrina and then also um, all types of sacred music to celebrate not only Palestrina but his legacy. So that's going to be medieval music, so before Palestrina, uh, you know, Baroque, Renaissance, modern, uh, 20th century music, all sorts of beautiful sacred music that they're going to sing in that context. And a lot of that music is going to relate to whatever feast we're celebrating. So, for example, our first event in January is going to be on the Feast of the Epiphany. And so the group that we're bringing in has actually done a whole uh, album they're called Skull Antigua of Chicago. They've done a whole album of early Renaissance and medieval Epiphany music. So they're actually singing the album all the way through. I think they're oh. doing most of the album for oh. that core holy hour. Okay. And then the main event of every e of each evening, once a month, right? The main event after the choral prelude, the choral meditation, is going to be a solemn mass um, featuring one of Palestrina's mass settings and then two of his motets at the offertory and at the communion. And so we're going to cover 12 of his like 100 mass settings, but wow. <laughs> yeah, at least we can scratch the surface, you know what I mean? <laughs> and we're going to cover some biggies. So, for example, we're bringing in some massive groups. We're bringing in, again, I said Skola Antigua from Chicago. Our headliner for the festival is in April on the on Easter Friday. So about a – it's April 25th that year. It's next year, 2025. So just about a year from now, we're bringing in the Talis Scholars from England, which is their, I would say, top five – Renaissance choirs in the world, in terms, and they've been around wow. since the 80s. I mean, they've cranked out hundreds of albums. Um, they'll be singing the Misa Papa Marcelli for us, which is, which until That's the time... That's a famous one, I've heard that it, one. It was the coronation mass sung at every papal coronation until Paul VI. It actually might have been, it actually might have been at Paul VI, is, and then it oh. stopped, like a lot of things. Um, and so uh, it was the coronation mass up until that point, and so it's a six-voice mass, absolutely stunning, one of those desert island pieces. You know, if we had to save anything... Hmm. From Western civilization, I think it would be Misa Papa Marcelli, the Bach B minor Mass, and maybe Durfle's Requiem. Those would be my three. Oh, okay. But it ranks up there in terms of like sacred music that like explains everything. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. Um, so they're going to be singing that Mass. We're bringing in the Jesualdo Six, which is an amazing sextet from Britain, all male sextet. They're going to be singing some lovely music. We're going to bring in the London Oratory Scola in July for the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which has a lot of significance. Um, they're coming in. That's about 45 English choir boys, um, oh, wow. stuffing them in the choir loft and they're, and they actually sing this music all the time. So they're from the London oratory, which is, which was father Faber's church in London. He was a disciple of Newman. They're amazing. It's an amazing parish river in London, ever in Brompton neighborhood out there. Um, they're going to come and sing and they do this stuff all the time. So it's kind of exciting to see a group that doesn't just do it professionally, like in concert settings, but does it like liturgically all the oh, time. Okay. So nice. they're coming out and then a ton of, um, Amazing domestic groups. Um, the Scola Cantorum from our uh, Metropolitan Cathedral in Detroit, they're coming out and singing. Um, they're not domestic technically, but they're coming because they're coming from Toronto. Uh, the theater, uh, theater of Early Music, they're coming out to sing. Um, His Majesty's Men, which is a wonderful uh, up-and-coming um, quintet from Chicago, they're coming out to sing that year. My Ensemble, Gaudete, uh, we're singing in September of that year. Another group, Vox GR, which is a local Grand Rapids choir, they're going to come sing. So it's a, it's a combination wow. of the local, the international, and the like the very professional domestic. Now, are there any yeah. special ecclesiastical guests besides His Excellency, our own bishop? Um, uh, I can confirm two. We're waiting on some. We have some invites out that I cannot publicize yet, but I'll be. I mean, you would be happy to. I'll let you know once we know. But we will. We'll be bringing in. Um, Bishop uh, Fernandez from the Diocese of Columbus. Yes, I know him. Yeah, he's coming in. I think he's doing uh, he's doing the Requiem for the All Souls in November. Okay. Um, uh, and then um, Bishop Perry, the former the recently retired Auxiliary Bishop of Chicago, he's coming in as oh, well okay. to celebrate September that, the September Mass that year. Uh, and then we have some other asks out, um, which That's hopefully will come through. But we can't say anything until they come through. Um, so that's so we'll have a couple of pontifical, at least two pontifical masses thrown in there, uh, with bishops, which it will be very 
very well, exciting. That's, that's very exciting. Yeah. So, so uh, and there's a website, right? Palestrina500.com. Yeah, P A L E S T R I N A 500.org. .org. Yeah, Palestrina500.org. Okay. Uh, go check out the website. Um, this is entirely, you know, we have I have a music budget that I work with. This is just full disclosure as a as a as the music director, right? But this is totally external to that. This is entirely a, a, a fundraised thing. So I'm I'm um, we have had some lovely underwriters step through to underwrite these events. I'm still looking for some if anyone's interested in or and sponsoring an organization that you have or even just a personal in memory of someone. If you want to underwrite one of these events, you can please, you can get in contact with me through that website. Um, but we're also just crowdfunding this thing um so we've already raised um a bet right around sixty five thousand dollars up to this point our goal to the, the the bare minimum to get this thing off the ground and running get everyone paid have receptions is um one hundred fifty thousand dollars so we're about halfway there um with about what eight months out until the till the first event next january till the first choral event next january um the end of the year uh the end of the year will end with our parish choirs and also some of the professional choirs from our uh, city coming to come together and we're going to sing a great big mass by Palestrina all together. I'm hoping for about 60 voices up in the choir loft. If I can oh. don't invite the fire marshal, he's not allowed uh, <laughs> to come. It'll be pretty, it'll be pretty jam packed. But anyway, uh, any, obviously we, 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 we need your help. We need donations. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a crowdsourced thing, but the support that we've received already is amazing. And, um, I have many colleagues throughout the country who, who, uh, sick, other sacred musicians, um, who can't believe that we're insane enough to, to try this. Um, one, because it's entirely for free. I've had other people, uh, non-Catholics, but music directors in the city, in the American Guild of Organists, for, for example, in town, who've, who've come to me and they're like, uh, when can I buy tickets? And I'm like, this is, it's the house of God. Like, we're not, this is not a ticketed event. The choral yeah. meditation's not ticketed. Because it's worship. It's where This isn't, this yeah. isn't. You know, that would be some form of simony or something. No, I don't know. Yeah, it would be something. Yeah, you know. But I'm like, there's just no way we can do that. You know, it's, it's going to be insane. I mean, capacity is going to be kind of crazy. You might have to tent. You know, <laughs> you might have to camp out for for some of the stuff. But it, but but we want you to be able to come and hear the Talus Scholars for free. Why? Um, not because um, because because this music is not. It's not ours to profit all. It, it, this music's greatest profit is is of an eternal value. It's of the value of the soul, right? And and for anybody, Catholic or non-Catholic, to come and hear this music in its proper context, in its divine context, in the context that uh, he was, that Palestrina wrote it for, for ultimately for the glory of God, not just in an in a abstract kind of way, but it rooted in the in the divine liturgy, in the in the greatest form of prayer, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. You know, to hear that music in that context, that is of, you know, inestimable value. You know, it's priceless mm -hmm. uh, and it converts souls and it changes souls and it brings constellation to thousands of people, hundreds of people, thousands of thousands of people, you know, so. And uh, is yeah. there also going to be like uh, some sort of recording of it as well? Like, we're, we're, we're working out those details, you know, it, that's a um, not just a budget question, but also a question of um, we kind of believe we have kind of a shrine mentality with this. Like we want to be a shrine to divine beauty. Um, kind of like, you know, if you build it, they will come. You know, we kind of have this idea that, like, we kind of want people to make pilgrimages out here. You know, it's a kind of, it's a, kind of the same idea with, like, live-streamed masses. Like, you need to be there. We're physical people, uh, and we want to encourage people to come. Now, there's going to be people that want to support us, and they can't come. I would like to bring forth some sort of recording, like, kind of a, like, best of, kind of, like, maybe album that we could cut. Because I don't think that would corrupt... That would be something that we could meditate on after the fact, you know, again. And, but in terms of doing a full video live stream, it just, it'll, it'll reduce the glory of being there. Like, I don't think you can capture it, you know, we can capture some of it, but it's sort of like, I, I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's kind of, um, kind of a platitude, but I just feel like I really believe in this idea of like being there to experience it. I think I, I'm a firm believer in the power of, because you can hear the Talos scholars on recording, you know, mm -hmm. and any recording that they've made professionally is going to be better than any recording that we're going to make live in our church. But because you're going to have, it's going to be cool to have the bells ringing and the thurible, you know, clinking away, but yeah. to have the 45 children screaming, <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. The, which I think while you're there, it's visceral. It's kind of fun. You know, it, it's, it, this is mass. This is a living, this is our living cult, right? The cultists, like the living beating rituals. It, it's living, right? It, um, it's alive. It's organic. It's fertile. It's everything. But you don't want that on a recording necessarily, and and um, 
you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I, I just absolutely. feel like I like that. I just feel like the the visceral experience is kind of what we're going for. And if you are in the greater Midwest, or even if you're not and you want to come out, you know, um, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to come and experience it. It it, can, it could be kind of crazy at times, I think, but I think, I think our Lord. Um, well, of course he's going to show up, you know, to use the old Protestant expression, you know, you know, God, God showed up, you know, I think it's always hilarious. Well, of well, course he yeah, showed he up. He does every mass. <laughs> he does every mass, <laughs> you know, but if I can bend that to our will, it's like, well, you know, we believe that this music, you know, greatly, you know, affects the uh, <clears throat> dispensation of the heart, the dispensation of the soul to receive sacramental grace. And so um, I think he's always fully present there, but I think he'll be very fully present to you. He's objectively fully present there, but this music makes him incredibly believable we're all like you know thomas saint thomas right like we need we need these helps we need these aids uh and this music will help us you know make visible the invisible yes you know so well that's this is this is so exciting i'm so much more excited about this whole yeah. event than i was previously i was already excited yeah um i just love this so much um so there is uh my favorite uh philosopher Dietrich von Hillebrand. Yeah. In his aesthetics, he says that the the thing about music is that it's the most spiritual of all the arts. Yes. And uh, I think you've really touched on so many deep things and yeah. uh, in this interview. And I can't wait to talk more after we click stop recording. Yeah. Um, but Palestrina, as you said, it, that was so profound to me looking at it just from a historical perspective, how yeah. Palestrina um, <clears throat> is the one who baptizes the Renaissance because there was all there was a big uh question at the council of trent the renaissance is kind of a bad thing because the people are getting pagan humanist stuff but no they're they're actually going to baptize this human heart this this glorified yeah. man yeah wow, that's amazing um so go to palestrina 500.org dot org yeah share the website donate to the website yeah please share and sure, sure, sure. Uh, if you're disappointed that there's not going to be a live stream go create this in your own parish in your own community that's brilliant yeah so, any final thoughts, Jonathan? Yeah, I think you know. Just we'll end with the palace. The uh, more um, about his his historical placement at the Council of Trent. You know, um, Palestrina was also very involved in Saint Philip Neri's oratory. He was. He actually. There's. There's evidence that he probably wrote some music for. You know, because Philip Neri had these sort of these. Uh, the oratorio, the musical form, comes out of the oratory, because they would have had these. Um, theatrical plays with lovely music about sacred, about lives of the saints, about biblical characters. But they also had like these sort of like holy hours, you know, these, these times of like immense Eucharistic adoration, the 40 hour devotion is an, a, a, one of these fruits of Philip Neri and, you know, Anthony, St. Anthony Mar Maria Zaccaria, these priests that would, you know, go into Eucharistic adoration and, and would be accompanied by this glorious sacred music, you know, and, and, and what were they doing in, in, in the wake of a Europe that was being rip, ripped apart by the reformation um, and by a, this this political belief in a faceless God, as opposed to a belief in a real and present and warm and you know, a real flesh and blood God that we venerate on upon our altars, we worship upon our altars, I should say. Um, what do they do? They use sacred music and sacred art to bring unity and also to bring healing in a culture that was that was suffering, you know, and that was being attacked by Satan ultimately. Um, and Palestrina was a huge figure in that as well. So, like, again, evangelizing through beauty, Palestrina did that very well. Philip Neary gave him last rites when he was dying, you know. There's an account oh, wow. from Palestrina's son, a beautiful account upon. And St. Philip Neary, the saint, is thanking Palestrina for his contributions to, to beauty. Wow. I mean, that it makes you chills, awesome. right? Like, it's amazing, you know. <laughs> so you have two, these massive figures of Renaissance Catholicism, of Italian Catholicism. And, again, that's kind of our hope as well, right? Like, our world has been rent apart. Uh, you know, a new paganism emerges. Um, the Reformation has done, has run its course, and has left uh, the West in void. It's left, a, it, it's left us as a graveyard, you know, and it's had its own uh, effect, a horrible effect upon Catholicism. And this festival is needed right now. And not just festival, but like you said, to be shared and to be inspiration to other Catholic parishes to say, this is doable. Not even just on the, maybe as a grandiose a scale. Hopefully, if someone does it more grandiose than we do. Yeah. You know, and hopefully, not <laughs> only is this a special thing that we do for a year, but my goal is to that this sets us up, uh, it's get, gives us a standard at our own parish to do this all the time, right? To to continue doing this kind of thing. But but we need beauty. Beauty will save the world, right? Dostoevsky, right? Beauty will save the world. 
and um, beauty properly ordered to God and his divine liturgy will save our culture and our society and will bring consolation. And more than just saving the culture on a level, it will save the soul. It will save souls. And that's what we're here for. That's our number one goal. So there yeah. we go. Perfect. Yeah. Well, with that, why don't we pray a Hail Mary and we'll invoke the Sacred Heart of Jesus. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Have mercy on us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.